What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out Levin Times WWE Wasted White Hot Stars. Well, it's one of those things where WWE they'll have someone that's super over, mega over actually, over in a in a way organically, and they don't capitalize when the iron is hot. You know, they they have this particular situation this particular wrestler that's gotten over organically the people want them see as the people want to see him as the champion and they don't pull the trigger for whatever reason and maybe sometimes they wait a little bit long to pull the trigger or maybe they just don't pull the trigger at all with that individual um if you guys remember in my opinion Samoa Joe around the time when Brock Lesnar was the universal champion, I thought Samoa Joe would have been a perfect person to put, uh, to become the universal champion at that moment. Granted, we knew what they were all doing. Brock was beating all these top guys, so that way Roman could be the one to ultimately slay him. But I think he was just super white hot, super over at the time, and they didn't do it. People wanted to see Joe as the champ, and it never happened. He was super over, and they didn't pull the trigger. So, they never pulled the trigger with him, actually. So, we're going to check out some of these moments. Appreciate all the love and support you guys have shown on the channel. Let's do this thing. Boy, I wonder what prompted this topic to land on my desk. WWE really had a hard time making new top stars after that John Cena fellow took off, and a lot of that comes from the company's inability to capitalize on a ready-made star falling in their lap, mm -hmm. a problem the company seems to still be suffering from. We may be all of nine days removed from WrestleMania 39 and the shocking non-coronation of Cody Rhodes, but mm -hmm. it is safe to say that the decision and the subsequent sale of WWE paired with the confirmation of Vince McMahon's return haven't filled fans with much hope for Cody's future. Nope. But Cody isn't the only one who has felt the moderate heat of WWE's back burner. PFK fans, raise your arms and give me your strength. I'm gonna try and get through this one without losing my will to live as a wrestling fan. <laughs> Damn. Peaceful thoughts. Peaceful I'm Tempest thoughts. hailing from Parts Unknown, and these are 11 times WWE wasted white hot stars. But before we get on with this list, make sure of course that you like this video, subscribe and enable notifications to always on so you never miss a fun list just like it. And make sure you check out the two new episodes of Survival Series that have hit the airwaves this month here on PFK. Number 11, Damien Mizdow in 2015. Uh, he was super I was recently too. asked on our Patreon mailbag show, subscribe at patreon.com forward slash Russell Talk, what small wrestling decision still bothers me and I would still be hard pressed to find a different answer than Damien Mizdow not defeating The Miz for the right to become The Miz. No one can possibly <laughs> tell me that Damien Mizdow wouldn't have taken that gimmick further than The Miz has the last eight years. Maybe Mizdow would have actually <laughs> brought prestige back to the Intercontinental Championship. After becoming the, at the time, biggest loser in Money in the Bank history, yep. Damian Sandow took on a second career as the Miz's stunt double, which got over more than anyone could have hoped, including WWE themselves. No, he 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 made that role his own, bro. He it was it was one of those funny things that was hilarious because he legitimately <laughs> was his stunt double and he made it work. <laughs> Damien Mizdow became the best comedy act WWE had had in many a year, and WWE just couldn't have that, killing off the duo at WrestleMania 31 after months of teased splits. Mm -hmm. Mizdow was the runner-up in the Andre Battle Royal, and then got beat by The Miz, ending the feud and the hottest period of Mizdow's career. Mm -hmm. Number 10, Rusev in 2017. Huh, would you look at that? Yeah. It's Rusev Day. What was it that Vince McMahon said about the fans' love of Rusev Day? They were chanting it to mock him? Christ almighty, peaceful thoughts, peaceful thoughts. This was right in the thick of when it seemed as if WWE would punish stars for getting over on their own yep. accord. If you weren't told to do it, you better not f do it, no matter how loud the people are cheering for you. Rusev, Rusev was Day, one of bro. WWE's funniest wrestlers, giving us such gems as handsome Rusev, TV champion Rusev, and of course, Rusev Day, the holiest of days celebrated each and every day. The act of Rusev and Aiden English worked better than you would expect and yeah. caught fire at Clash of Champions 2017, where the lovely lads challenged for the SmackDown Tag Team titles. WWE don't seem to call audibles very often, but they would have been more than justified had they pulled the trigger on Aiden and Rusev given this incredible response. 
It's the SmackDown tag titles. It wouldn't have mattered. Instead, WWE seemed inclined to remove the Stone of Shame from Rusev's neck and instead attach the Stone of Triumph, having him get pinned by Jinder Mahal at WrestleMania 34, get betrayed by Aiden in a storyline that went nowhere, and then turn heel by WrestleMania 35. Yep. Happy Rusev Day indeed. Yep. Number 9, Cesaro in 2014. Oh, to travel back to early 2014 when Cesaro had only been on the main roster for two years and he was having excellent matches with Sami Zayn at NXT until it was time to split from Jack Swagger at WrestleMania 30. A time where there was still hope. Yeah. And at WrestleMania 30, what a f moment he had. Yeah. Cesaro won the inaugural Andre the Giant Royal Memorial Battle Memorial back when <laughs> there was also hope for that stipulation in one of the biggest highlights of a pretty darn decent WrestleMania and people mm -hmm. were excited. And then the very next day, WWE cut the knees out from under the babyface run of Cesaro precisely 24 hours in. The very next night on Raw, WWE took a prospective new top babyface star and put him with Paul Heyman. Now, Cesaro and Paul Heyman sounds like a winning pair, yeah, but the does. problem then became WWE never actually followed through with Cesaro's ascent to the main event scene. Cesaro oh. never so much as sniffed a pay-per-view main event until 2021, when he was also quite hot, albeit with no crowd, yeah. but even in this case, Cesaro got beat and slipped back down the card. Yeah. Number eight, Asuka in 20... And I know people's, I guess, gripe about Cesaro, he's not good on the microphone, hence, that's why Paul Heyman was there. Once they grouped him with him, I was like, okay, this is something. They got something here. He doesn't have to be the best on the microphone. You can have him go out there and destroy people. They didn't really follow through with it. 2018. As we continue to get into, booking baby faces has never been WWE's forte. Nope. It has been too complicated much of the time, with the company too often relying on beating their heroes like a dusty rug at spring cleaning, so resulting stupid. in those stars losing their shine like Rey Mysterio in 2006, Sami Zayn in 2016, or Bayley in 2017. Yep. Now, how do you fix that problem? Surely, a baby face with a huge undefeated streak takes that problem right out of your hands. Asuka arrived on the main roster at TLC 2017 and immediately the vibes were just off compared to her run in NXT. She still won a bunch of matches, but no longer was she an unstoppable force, instead selling for folks like Emma and Nia Jax when she had been killing them in NXT. Mm -hmm. But it's just a little less over. It's still good. It's still good. She won the Royal Rumble, really the only finish that made sense given the occasion, and yeah. all signs pointed to Asuka beating Charlotte at WrestleMania 34 until that very much didn't happen. But she's just a little less undefeated. It's still good. It's still good. But then rather than having that distinction elevate Charlotte, she lost to Carmella twice in a row. And to really hit the point home, Asuka then lost to Carmella twice in a row as well. But she's just a little... Oh, it's gone. I know. Mm -hmm. Number seven, yeah. Dolph Ziggler in 2013. I think she should have... I think a lot of people even now agree. Uh, feel like she should have won at WrestleMania, which I think she should have. I, I, I love Bianca. I don't know what they have planned for, but I think her winning would have been something nice. Maybe she... Gets a rematch, something happens at Backlash, but I do think she should have won at WrestleMania. That's just my opinion. Oh, Dolph, it should have been me, Ziggler. Facts. At one point, it really should have been you. At a few points, really. The biggest of which, of course, has to be the once greatest Money in the Bank cash-in ever in 2013 where Mr. Ziggles won the World Heavyweight Championship on the Raw after WrestleMania. The moment that had been built up to for nine months and paid off perfectly, seemingly ready to launch Dolph into the main event scene, and then Dolph got a concussion. Yeah. Now, granted, that is out of WWE's control. One of the greatest cash-ins of all time. One of the greatest cash-ins. I'd sometimes go watch that Dolph Ziggler cash-in just to, like, reminisce on just how fucking crazy that crowd went, bro. What wasn't out of their control, however, was WWE playing this off as comedy with Dolph forgetting that he had cashed in and then losing to notable prick Alberto Del Rio in his first title defense at Payback. Yeah. It was Vince's thought that giving Dolph the title was merely the right thing to do for that moment, but he had no intention of giving Dolph the accompanying push. That's Seems dumb to cold. me, but what's dumber is getting another chance to give Dolph the rub a year later with yep. a fantastic performance at the 2014 Survivor Series. Yes. And rather than following that up with any sort of big moment Bro, for Dolph. Oh, he won it for the team. They didn't do nothing. He, he had lost his steam, lost the heat, got it back for that Survivor Series team, and they didn't do nothing with it. They didn't do nothing. I'm like, okay. Dolph is the guy again, and they, they didn't do nothing. Dolph, they brought the authority back and fired Dolph in kayfabe a month after his triumph. 
It should have been you, Dolph. It should, it should have. have been you. <laughs> Number six, Zack Ryder in 2011. Oh, woo, man. woo, woo. You blew it, bro. <laughs> Before Matt Cardona was the self anointed king of the indies, Zack Ryder was the internet fans' champion. Mm -hmm. Quite literally, in fact. Look at him with his internet championship. At the start of 2011, Zack Ryder was comfortably the bottom of the WWE roster totem pole. Mm -hmm. Ryder then took to YouTube and Twitter with his show Z True Long Island Story, he which got, got steadily over. more and more popular until fans campaigned for him to be featured regularly on TV. He actually did the thing WWE always calls for their stars to do, get themselves over, make their own opportunity. He legit got, I think he, in my opinion, I think he goes down as the pioneer and the only person I know in WWE history that got over on YouTube. I remember watching it because I was like, who is this guy? And I started watching it and it was, he would have funny little skits like push me Vince. Like it worked, but it, Vince didn't like that shit. And I was like, bro, he got over on himself. He took social media because WWE, I believe they were on YouTube, but they weren't really pushing it. He took that and made it his own. He went out. That To me, if I'm an owner of a wrestling company, and I'm not really too, too versed with social media, but you were to able to get yourself over through social media, that's initiative. Oh, shit. Oh, okay. All right. Let, let, let me see what you got. Let me see if it's real. And it was. Opportunities and grab the brass ring. Except they don't actually want that. That no. is a lie. Ryder managed to win the United States title at TLC 2011, but lost it in short order before being the biggest victim of John Cena's asshole nature, stealing Zack's girlfriend, yeah. and then striking him while Zack was getting pushed off stages in wheelchairs. They Not exactly him. the main event push WWE fans they were clamoring for. The magic him. was gone for Ryder after this, as he went back to being routinely beaten into powder by the actual stars that WWE were interested in promoting. They screwed Number him, five, bro. the Nexus in 2010. Ugh. Lord above, John Cena does not come out of this list looking good, does he? No, he yeah, it turns out that when WWE was looking to waste one of their white hot stars, feeding them to John Cena was their go-to move. In the case of the Nexus, their debut was the high point of Raw in 2010, mm -hmm. giving WWE their big summertime angle. Wade Barrett and his band of merry men were due for a major win at SummerSlam, but John Cena quite literally said, that doesn't work for me, brother. The Nexus went from being the biggest invading force WWE had had since the invasion to John Cena's verbal punching bags in one night. Yep. Cena beat them decisively at SummerSlam and then went on Raw the next night, calling them names, comparing them to fast food mascots, and he may as well have looked right down the lens of the camera and told WWE fans never to take these men seriously again. And really, they didn't. The Nexus storyline went down as one of the biggest missed opportunities in the company's yep. history, and it didn't have to be this way. Nope. They could have just beaten Cena at SummerSlam. Yep. Like, why why was that so hard? Don't know. Number four, The Fiend in 2019. Yeesh. For the first match of a new character, you can't ask for a much better showing than The Fiend's match with Finn Balor at SummerSlam 2019. Mm -hmm. I would know. I was there. The Fiend's invincibility worked perfectly into this one-sided debut match, and a strong win and bone-chilling entrance combined for a great mm -hmm. introduction for a new and intriguing top star on Raw. That and that shit was great. <laughs> His intro was sick. His appearance was sick. One of the moves, it looked like he literally broke Finn Balor's neck. He just, I was like, oh my God, this was great. And then we have Hell in a Cell. Then WWE decided to immediately book him in a universal title match that they didn't want him to win. That Why did stupid. they do this? So well, dumb. I can't tell you because I don't know. So this was WWE dumb. in 2019 after all, not the time in which they were making their smartest decisions. Hell in a Cell 2019 was the site of maybe the worst main event in WWE history, Facts. effectively killing off the runs of Seth Rollins, yep. The Fiend, yep. the Hell in a Cell stipulation, and yep. pretty much all interest in the main event scene of Raw. A terrible feud with The Miz and a speedy loss to Goldberg did not help matters for all Fiendy Pops, but nope. it further proved that WWE really didn't have a plan for their new top star after the first night. Number three, yep. Daniel Bryan in 2018. Mm. How is it possible that WWE took a returning Daniel Bryan, the biggest potential babyface star they could ever ask for in 2018, fresh off a two year retirement and put him in a months long feud with big Cass. Yeah. Daniel Bryan being able to wrestle again was a dream come few for wrestling fans of all walks of life. And it would have required great restraint not to simply put him in the main event of WrestleMania 34 and win the universal title immediately, but hot dog, did they ever go in the opposite direction? Yeah. Instead, Bryan teamed up with Shane McMahon in the second best McMahon tag match of the night to face Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. 
on paper, a good pairing, but the match started with an attack from the heels, taking Brian out of the match until the finish, and taking the air out of the building. But again, mm -hmm. one match to ease Brian back in, understandable. Why they then chose Big Bill to be Brian's next feud, I will never know. Brian's momentum continued to slow throughout the year with an underwhelming feud with The Miz before only reaching the top of the card again by turning heel. And that was crazy because they really had something, but they didn't capitalize. Granted, I do say him turning heel really, you know, it was it was something fresh, something new, and I enjoyed his heel turn. It was definitely something different. I very much enjoyed it. And then we ended up getting Kofi Mania in the process of it. But at the time... You would have thought this should have been one of the this the yes movement is back. They didn't really capitalize on it. They were still hung up on Roman Reigns and everything else involving him and stuff. So the biggest possible babyface forced to turn heel in order to be booked well. Yeah. For shame, WWE. Number two, CM Punk in 2011. Now I know there will be people who will be quick to say that CM Punk got a 434 day title reign out of his 2011, and you would be right. However, it is impossible to look at the Summer of Punk circa 2011 as the success that it should have been. Yeah. After the all time classic Money in the Bank main event that saw CM Punk hightail it out of Chicago with a WWE championship mm -hmm. in hand, he was the biggest deal WWE had had in a very long while. Very and long time. And then WWE followed yeah. that up by Butchered closing it. out their next four straight pay per views with CM Punk having been pinned and beaten. By the time he won the WWE Championship back at Survivor Series, the uptick in interest caused by CM Punk's pipe bomb and subsequent title win had all but depleted. It was supposed to be the summer of Punk. Instead, it was about the three weeks of Punk before WWE's terrible booking tendencies reared their ugly heads. Seriously, what part of that Money in the Bank program screamed, this needs more Kevin Nash to y'all? No. Baffling stuff, but not as baffling as number one, Cody Rhodes <laughs> in 2023. <laughs> number one. <laughs> oh, uh, this is going to be a good one. <laughs> now, I will preface this one by saying that there is still time for Cody Rhodes to be saved following his WrestleMania 39 loss to Roman Reigns. However, boy, was that ever the right time to pull the trigger. Gosh. I watched the closing sequence of Owens hitting the stunner, yes. Sammy hitting the haluva kick, yes. and Cody hitting the bionic elbow and yes. crossroads. And you can argue about adversity all you want, oh but I don't God. know that you will ever find a more perfect <laughs> ending to the Roman Reigns run of dominance than that moment. Cody Rhodes was white hot, peaking at the perfect moment, and WWE elected not to pull the trigger after oh, all. There is still God. every chance that it could pay off in the long run, but given that Roman isn't scheduled to work backlash, it really does sort of feel like stat padding at this point yes. in an attempt to get him to a thousand days as champion. Yes. A stat that didn't need to be padded at the sacrifice of the story being told. Facts. Cody may stay <laughs> as over as he had been. Hell, Sammy got a big moment for himself at WrestleMania after everything was said and done, but the main event of WrestleMania 39 as of this moment does unfortunately feel like one of the biggest wastes of a white hot star in wwe history and that's our list i most i agree i i am in total agreement. it makes sense i'm sorry i know some people think roman should no i am still gonna be one of those people they they are only doing it to stat pad they're stat padding so he can get to a thousand days yes it will be something we'll never see ever again but granted 900 and whatever days it is now it's still something we'll never see probably in our lifetime and you had someone that was white hot and you didn't capitalize for whatever reason you didn't capitalize it may happen at SummerSlam but I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you unless this story ramps up even more I just don't see it being the same as if you would have won at WrestleMania this year. That's just my personal opinion on it. But comment down below. Let me know which uh what's another wrestler you felt like had a they were you know white hot at one point in WWE should have pulled the trigger, but they didn't. Let me know down below if they weren't on this list. But I appreciate all the love and support. Road 250k and I am still getting speed to YouTube wrestling champ of the world. Appreciate y'all getting me. See you on the next one. Peace.